Good morning, Towersville Beach. That sounds good. Um, um, good to be worshiping with you this morning, and I'm so glad you decided to come in on what is a beautiful, beautiful day so we can worship together. I was reminded this week that we're going to sing this first song. This first song is called Praise You Anywhere, and I was just thinking through that. What does that mean? What does that look like? You know, that our, our worship isn't limited to this space, though I love that we can gather together and remember and celebrate together as a, a sort of a larger family. And I was reminded of uh, John chapter 4. This is one of my favorite passages where Jesus meets the woman at the well. And he basically reveals himself for the very first time as he really is the Messiah. He really is the Christ. And then as part of that, they're having this dialogue about, you know, she's saying, hey, I think we're only supposed to worship here. And you guys say we have to worship there. What is that all about? And Jesus kind of puts all that aside. And he, he says this in John chapter 4. Jesus says, believe me, a time is coming. When you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain he was talking about, nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. There's no longer bound to a certain place where we have to go in order to connect with God. We connect with him here in a special way, and we will connect with him throughout the week. In fact, some ways, this is a reflection of the, of the time that we've spent with him throughout this week, that we get to remember and celebrate together as a family what he's done, what he is doing, what he will do. So I'm going to encourage you to think on that as we sing. Would you stand and let's sing together? Ha! <laughs> 
说，说。
history can prove Nothing you can't do You're faithful and true Though the storms may come And the winds may blow I'll be Instead, I've compiled several verses from six different books of the Bible in hopes to convey God's love and mercy towards each and every one of us. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Psalm 86, 5. 
But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born in God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. John chapter 4, verse 9. We love because he first loved us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live is life in flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There's no amount of money, or man or woman, or job, or any other worldly pleasure comes close to the love that we are given from God. For his son's sacrifice on the cross is the ultimate form of love given to us so that we should have an opportunity at eternal life with him. We see this in the character of God described by Christ. His love for lost sinners and his perfect justice meets at the cross. Before the men come forward, I'd like to leave you with this. The only reason that we are here today, the only reason that any, that any of this matters is because of the love that God has given us. The love displayed in the death on Calvary. Without this love, we are nothing. So be thankful for this morning. And now I'd like to invite the men forward to pray for the communion of supper with others. Father, we ask you to bless us this time as we come to remember our Savior, the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross, that his body was beaten and his blood was shed to pay the penalty for us, that we may have forgiveness, we may have salvation through him, through his blood, in his name we pray, amen. <laughs> Preschoolers and junior high school back here. Elementary, you can follow me downstairs.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, it's good to see you on a beautiful day, and so glad you've come here to <clears throat> honor the Lord and to worship Him and to uh, give Him uh, the glory through His name. Glad you're here. <coughs> we have a number of things. I first want to say I want to thank uh, all of you who came and was part of uh, the Vacation Bible School that we had this past week. I won't have you stand, but if you were able to come and help, a bunch of you are, are here this morning. Uh, if you were not, if you had, had taken off on some vacations and such. But if you were there, just raise your hand wherever you are. If you came and worked our BBS, yeah, they're kind of all over the place. Thank you all. I mean, others of you maybe did all other things too to help it, but it was really a great time. Uh, probably all together we had, what, 18, 20 kids all together? Most, but we had almost as many helpers. Yeah, we had almost as many helpers. So, yeah, it went really well. And uh, we had uh, the three good nights last Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And uh, so it was really, really a good, a good time. I especially uh, thank all of you who came and who worked, came each night. It was so good to have uh, Bobby and uh, Becca with us each night. Becca came and, and uh, led the uh, opening and closing with music and different stuff that she would do with them was always a lot of fun. So we're real thankful that, that she came. I uh, well, thank all of you who did a bunch of work on the staging, which is all gone. It was all gone. I like my flashing lights back here. That was really nice, you know. Uh, but uh, for uh, all that took place, it was really good. So thank you so much. We are beginning our summer camps. <clears throat> if you know of some, I got a few others from Mindy this week. Um, I'm hoping some of our camps can go on, um, depending on what we're doing and how many are coming. But if you know of any who are planning on coming and you haven't told me, then I don't know unless you're telling me. Or if there's other friends, family out there who, y'all, yeah, I know they're coming. Well, I need to know so that we can, can really plan. So that will be really helpful. We're hoping to have the first one this week of hide and seek. Then on the 19th, it's in your, in your bulletin. The fishing shooting camp on the 19th and the town tour on the 27th, all in June. And so make sure to let me know and then we can be uh, be prepared for, for all of them to come. Well, we have a few prayer needs this morning and we certainly want to spend some time in praying this good morning. And let me mention a few that are on our list. Bertie Lou, of course, Roxana, please pray for them. Um, Pray for uh, Ignite the Norse, our ministry over at NKU. It's going really well. We're so glad to have the executive director who preached here. Uh, and then uh, we finalized the hiring of our worship director that is going to be helping us week to week. So we're really happy about that too. And uh, but pray as we go through a busy summer for sure. Audi Kiao and all the stuff happening still over in Myanmar. Carter Berkeley over still in training. And uh, uh, a couple of others we want to, to pray. First of all, uh, for Kevin Doyle. And I know we've been praying for him. Terrible accident just uh, two, I don't know, three weeks ago. Yeah, time goes fast or slow, I guess, depending on your perspective and where you are. But I know Mindy has a report for us. What are some things you'd like to tell us about what's going on? So he finally <clears throat> woke up on Friday. They kept the vent in just to be sure that he didn't need it. They didn't want to have to put it back in if they took it out when he needed it. So he took it out this morning. He, so he's completely off the vent. He did ask um, for them to please explain to him what was going on. Um, and he asked for Diet Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know you're doing okay when you ask for a Diet Pepsi. That's, that's a big step forward. So, good, good deal. They are still very worried about his liver and his kidneys. He has a drain in his liver right now um, that will be there for quite a while. But Some really good, hopeful, positive steps. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep praying. God's obviously working in his life when God saves you from something that could have killed you it's always for a good purpose and so we'll keep keep praying and for all of you i know it's been a long day after day there's a long days of of the healing process and, and all of that i always find out 
And today, the, the sermon, we're going to talk about adversity. Because Joseph certainly endured some great adversity. And uh, what are some of the keys to handling all of that? So, hope that will be encouraging. I hope to, to all of us. And uh, we also want to pray for Glenn Bess, for Vicki, the family. Um, I know we had heard Sunday school this morning that a couple days ago or even yesterday had a really bad day. He's in hospice. He is at home. Vicki had told me this week that if you want to come by, they're more than happy for you to come by, but please call first. He said certain people coming or they just want to make sure but otherwise, you're more than welcome to go by, but she'd love to see you. So if you want to do that, uh, just call and let her know. And that way, maybe several won't be there all at the same time and that kind of thing. But she would welcome you. And so she said, tell people uh, she's sure appreciating your ongoing prayers and Glenn as well. And uh, these days are, are tough days. And uh, but they're at peace. He's at peace with his decision. Peace that... Uh, uh, you know, he not only knows the Lord, he knows he'll be with him soon. And uh, Vicki has gone to some peace as well with all of that. And so just continue to pray for that. Um, let's see. So somebody else you had told me this morning. Um, Stanford Trinkle. Yeah, Stanford Trinkle. And uh, I know we had mentioned his name and uh, he'd gone to the doctor and so basically they've sent him home but within the next week two weeks then there will be a surgery and he absolutely needs this surgery and so hopefully that will certainly all take place and uh, we'll pray for him other needs that we have in the church this morning any other needs at all no well let's go before the lord Lord, it's such a blessing that we can be together. We, I know on different weeks, maybe just kind of take it for granted. Another week of church. And Lord, Lord, your, your presence is here. And Father, all the stuff that a lot of families are having to face day to day, every day, you're present in their lives. And we are so thankful for all of that. I'm thankful you hear our prayers. We know you do. And Lord, even how you respond and you tell us to ask and you tell us you want to bring us good gifts. And even though you don't do everything we just ask, you, you certainly show your mercy and your grace, your power, your healing, your comfort and peace every day in so many ways so we are so very thankful for all of that and so much more lord we pray for those that continue to hurt and are in healing lord we want to pray that you bless uh, glenn in these days and vicky as they understand the inevitable and yet father i pray the days will be filled with some smiles and a joy that comes from knowing you. That we don't grieve like the rest of the world, but we grieve in faith and hope and the knowledge of your son Jesus and all that you bring to us, especially life with each other and especially with you. So Father, we thank you for all of this and so much more. We pray your blessings. Help us to depend upon you. Help us to trust you in all things. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, the fact is, even as we have been praying right now, we all face adversity. We all know that. Throughout all of our lives, there's been adversities. Sometimes it's been little bitty things, Maybe the annoyance of a certain thing that happened on a given day. And yet all of us, as we've lived long enough, there's been some really, really dire and difficult adversities. Real life problems. And they can be devastating. James Dobson in his book, When God Doesn't Make Sense, writes about an incident in his life. 
<coughs> it had been that kind of month. Frustrations were coming by the boatloads. Shirley was gone to a conference and I decided to go to my favorite hamburger stand and pick up supper. I jumped into my son's Honda, not remembering that I had canceled the insurance when he went back to college. I tried to drive so carefully. I looked both ways at each corner, one stupid mistake, and I knew I could lose our house. I arrived safely at the hamburger shop drive through The muffled adolescent voice asked, may I take your order, please? I ordered and then drove forward to take out to the takeout window where I handed was handed a sack of great smelling greasy hamburgers. And there I was, hanging out the window, nice and loose, when an elderly lady lost in control of her Mercedes Benz. Her foot slipped off the brake and slammed the accelerator. It was like a Sherman tank hitting a baby bunny. Ryan's Honda and I were flying down the driveway for parts unknown. I never did find the hamburgers. I was stunned. The lady came running to me to see if I was all right. She said, I'm so sorry. I did this uh, to someone else two weeks ago. <laughs> Please don't report me. I'll fix your car. He said, I should have reported it, but I did not have the heart. She was having the same kind of month I was having. Now, some of you are saying, if that's the worst thing that ever happens to you, then, you know, count your blessings. And you're probably right. But here's the problem with adversity. And we know this is a truth amidst all adversity and troubles and problems. It is easier to talk about them. It is easier for us to reminisce about what had happened in the past than it is to live, live in the middle of them. It's a whole different thing. It's a whole different thing when you're in the middle of the difficulty. And it's difficult to be faithful and to be trusting in the middle of that difficulty. Oh, it's easy, right, for a preacher to stand out and talk about adversities. We're going to read some nice verses. We're going to hear about Joseph this morning and how he handled his adversities. It's a whole other thing when you're in the middle of it. When you're trusting God, we sang some great songs this morning. Great songs of truth and promise and hope that we have in Christ when things are not so good. And it's easy to sing them or difficult to live them out. We all know that. It's easy to be a thought theological, but it's difficult when we're in the middle of it. But here's the truth. It's not impossible. While it might be very difficult, it is not impossible. You and I can stay strong. You and I can stay faithful. There are people in this room right now who have been living through stuff. We count over the past year, people who have lived through one of the hardest difficulties of all of life, and through every moment of it, they lived in faith and in courage and determination. And this morning, I want all of us to believe that we can too. So we're going to learn some things this morning. I hope be encouraged, be reminded about those things that whenever life kind of goes chaotic and difficult, God is there. He has not left us. He is working out his purposes in our lives. While he could have stopped some things, while he may have caused certain things, God it was there. He knows all that is going on. And so sometimes the prayer not only is asking God to do some great things in our situation, maybe it's reminding us about who we are and reminding us about who God is in the middle of that difficulty because it's so easy to forget. Well, we're going to study just for a few moments about Joseph. And we'll be doing so off and on throughout the entire summer. Now, Joseph's problems began when his father sent him out to a very hostile environment. In Genesis 37, Jacob says, Joseph, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. <coughs> Come, and I'm going to send you to them. This was not a good decision. Okay? His brothers were a mess. 
and they hated Joseph. You remember that. They were jealous of him in every way. They knew Joseph was the favorite. He had proclaimed that even by giving him that special coat that he wore and kind of flaunted in front of them all of the time. They had heard about the dreams that he had about ruling over them all later in life. In fact, the Bible says the brothers did not even have one good word to say about Joseph. Jacob must have been blind to see the brother's hatred for his son. There were 10 against one, and they had showed violence before. These, these fellows, their sister Dinah had been in this city and she had been raped. These brothers became so angry about what these people did in the city, they went in the city and they killed everyone in the town. They killed them all. Their hatred was so deep. Their resentment was so strong. And when Jacob found out about it, the Bible says that he was angry. But that was it. He didn't do anything about it. We know stories of David and others who kind of reacted in the exact same way. Matter of fact, Jacob said, you know, this is going to cause us some political problems. That's what Jacob said in response to his sons going and killing all these people. I can't even begin to imagine. Well, into this situation, into these brothers, Joseph was sent. He knew they were filled with resentment. They, he knew of their violent past. And they, he knew they hated Joseph. But he went. And this was a decision that he would soon regret for the rest of his life. Here's the lesson for us parents, I think. We should be aware of the spiritual dangers of this world. As parents, be aware when we are sending them out into different areas of life. Should we protect them or not? Even when they don't understand. Kathy and I were taking Josh to some colleges back in the day and we were in New York there were a couple three schools he wanted to look at he was eventually accepted to all three including NYU but we went back to this little place where we got to stay for a really special price it was an awful place wasn't it it was an awful little hole <laughs> but it was cheap <laughs> um, and so we stayed there and that night, Josh had a friend of his who lived in Manhattan, and so he had kind of put it off, but he asked me, can uh, I go back into the city and uh, go visit him? And we were, we were staying in Brooklyn, and he was going to have to go back into Manhattan. This was going to be a night. And I remember looking at him, I'm like, what are you talking about? Have you lost your ever-loving mind? I mean... I'm not going to go back into the city, and I'm fairly experienced in New York. I go, you're 18 years old. You're not going to be going into any city on your own at nighttime. That's just not, he just couldn't understand it. And I thought about that, that. There's no way that Jacob should have thought about sending his son into that dangerous situation. But he did. He just kind of. Wiped it all away. Oh, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Well, he wasn't going to be, be fine. And we as parents need to understand situations that we throw them into. We have many of you are sending your kids into college. We have, what, six? We had eight graduates just a couple of weeks ago going into college. I've been in college work for a long time. Do you know that 90% of 18-year-olds in America believe that premarital sex is not wrong. 90%, so that would include most all church kids too. They don't think it's wrong. So when you have 15, 20, 30,000 college kids all together living with that kind of mentality, well, you can pretty well know what to expect because they don't think there's any problem. 
And that's just one. There's a whole lot of other things I could list this morning. And why do they do that? Well, because they believe differently than maybe what you believe. They don't believe there's any problem, and they certainly aren't considering the consequences of that behavior. Well, sending our kids into situations sometimes is like lambs among the wolves. And we have to be aware. I received a letter from a lady a few years ago. Listen to some of the things she said. I believe the church is on the verge of great things, but we can be on the road to hell doing good things. I've learned personally that Satan is cunning and subtle. He snarls around and he arrogantly laughs at the victories. My burden is to challenge you to warn the church that our battle is not against flesh and blood. We have ignored the real enemy too long. He makes good look evil and the evil look good to way too many people. How true. Joseph went, his brother betrayed him, and they brutalized him. They took revenge and they plotted to kill him. Now here's the story. They said, let's throw him into the cistern and some wild animal can just devour him. But who cares what happens to Joseph? And that's what we'll tell old father dear, that the animals just ate him up. And uh, that's what happened. So we don't know what happened to him. You know, it's been said that when, what, what, I, what I know is that what a lot of people will do in a group, they will not do alone. There's an old saying that if you have three or more dogs traveling together, beware, because dogs get bold when they're in a group. And so do people. These brothers became dangerous as a group. And they said, let's kill him. Only one tried to stop it. That was Reuben. He was the oldest one. He had been around the longest. Maybe he was thinking about his father. Maybe he had a heart twinge about Joseph himself. But he said, I tell you what, let's throw him into the cistern and take the coat back and tell dad that an animal had killed him. The Bible says Reuben was doing this so that when they would go back, he could circle back around, rescue Joseph, and set him free. But his plan did not work, and it failed for two reasons. Number one, he was cowardly. Why did not Reuben stand up for his brother and even for his father? He was cowardly against his other brothers. Maybe he thought they would do the same thing to him. He knew what they were like, but he failed. The second reason, he said that he uh, didn't have the courage to stand up to his brothers and he lacked credibility with his brothers. You see, before Reuben had slept with his father's concubine, uh, Bilha, and so they had lost respect for Reuben. You know, sometimes you lead out of respect. It's not that you're smarter. It's not that you know stuff other people don't know. But people follow people who they respect. And obviously, in this case, they did not respect their oldest brother. So they weren't going to do anything that he said. And maybe he already knew that. Well, he failed. And so the brothers began to carry out the plan. In verse 23, okay, this is in, um, in Genesis there. It says they threw him into the cistern. It was empty. There was no water. And they take his robe. What they're going to plan to do is they'll kill an animal, put some blood on the robe, and so they were going to do that. Here's what I was thinking. Wonder what Joseph was thinking. Through all of this, what was going through his mind? What a terrible thing to happen. Sure, he had problems with his brothers, but they weren't trying to scare him. They intended to kill him. They beat him up, they laughed at him, and they ignored his cries for help. Now, how cold could these brothers actually be? I'll tell you how cold. Because the Bible tells us that after they do all, they beat him up. They throw him down into the cistern. That had to have hurt. There was no water there. He had no idea what was going to go on. They're going to leave him? That's probably what he was thinking. And Joseph was just left there to die. 
What's going to really happen to me? Am I ever going to make it out of this? They had no idea. But the brothers, after doing all of that, they went back to the house and had supper. Didn't bother them at all. Cold-hearted. They did not care. That's what his brothers did. And then it says that after they sat down to eat, they saw these Ishmaelite traders coming by. Now, was that a coincidence? I don't think so. You see, we've got to be reminded, and people will say this all the time, certain things will happen in terrible situations, and then all of a sudden, in sometimes little bitty things, sometimes in great big things, God shows up. Somebody was telling me a story recently about an accident, and that that the person who was there was a nurse. She knew exactly what to do. And if she did, wasn't there and did what she did, the person would have died. It was a friend of mine telling me about the situation in his family. <laughs> and then they looked at me and said, I think God knew that. I think God knew that. God put her there that day. It wasn't just a coincidence. And it was no coincidence that these traitors showed up because God was doing something in Joseph's life. Oh, the brothers meant some stuff to be really bad. That was not God. But amidst the bad, then God says, well, I'll show up and I'll do something and I'm going to bring some great things out of this that they don't even know about. Joseph doesn't even know about it. And so that's exactly what happened. God was in this, and he wanted to break the pride of Joseph. He wanted to introduce him to royalty in Egypt. And so when his time was to be involved, he would be ready to even help his own family. I think this tells us, again, that God is involved in every part of our lives. The good, he's there. The bad, he's there. He's not gone anywhere. When bad things happen, it's not like God took a vacation. No, he was in the middle of it. He was right there. He does not keep everything from happening bad in our lives. We know that. And he's present. And he was present in Joseph's life. Just like, and he works in us just like he did in Joseph. God knew what he was doing. And make no mistake, God knows what he is doing in our lives too. So they sold Joseph for 20 shekels, the Bible said. You know how much 20 shekels is? $5.20. They sold him for $5.20. Now, I don't know. Maybe that was a lot of money back in that day. But $5.20 for their youngest brother. They took him to Egypt. The brothers took the robe. The robe they hated. And he gave them, I bet, a lot of pleasure to rip it all up. Put blood all over it. They've been wanting to destroy that coat for a long time. And they take it to Jacob. And they basically just say, we found this robe. Examine it to see if it is your son's. <laughs> so they don't tell him a lie. They just go about deceiving him. They just let him come to his own conclusions of the evidence that was being presented. Joseph looked at the robe. He knew it was Joseph's. And he says, surely he has been torn to pieces by some wild animal. Jacob tore his clothes. He put sackcloth on. And he mourned his son. And the brothers came to comfort Jacob, it says. But Jacob would not see any of them. I think that Jacob knew that these brothers did not. They, he knew they didn't care for Joseph. And when they came, my guess is they came with a little bit of a smirk and he knew they really didn't mean it, so get away from me. Have you ever had anybody come and say thank you or I'm sorry and you knew they really weren't sorry? Get away from me. That was Jacob. Just don't bother me with your little platitudes. Notice not one of these ten brothers, not one, not even Reuben, came to their dad and said, Dad, I can't stand the grief that you're going through. I am so sorry. Here's what we did. He's alive. Your son Joseph is alive. 
He's, he's okay. Matter of fact, we know where we can go get him. No. The hatred and resentment was so deep within them. Here's something I'm wondering about. What was going on in Joseph's mind while he was on this trip? Can you imagine? Remember, Joseph was 17 years old. 17. He believed in Jehovah God. And here he was in the middle of his terrible situation. I'm sure he was glad to be alive. His hands were tied. He was being treated like an animal. Have you ever noticed, and some of you know, even most recently, life can change in a heartbeat. Today we're sitting in this room. All of us, as far as I know, relatively, probably healthy. All comfortable, you know. Air conditioned on just right today. It's not dripping anymore. Got it all fixed. You know, it's all nice and comfy, comfy little padded seats. Life is pretty, it's okay right now, right? We have no idea what's going to happen this afternoon or tomorrow or any other day. In a heartbeat, life can change. Just like that. You discover a lump on your body and it could be cancer. The phone rings and the teacher says, I've caught your child with drugs. You're called into the boss's office and says, we don't need you anymore. Dad had a heart attack. You're driving along the road like any other day. A truck pulls out in front of you. On and on the stories can go. On any day. On any moment. It can happen so quickly. It seems one moment we're so strong. Right? We can handle anything. And in the next moment, it's all falling apart. And we don't know what to do next. Job said, a man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Here's Joseph, 17, healthy, wealthy, pampered by his father. Father, And in the next moment, he's tied up by a bunch of men who are taking him off to a whole new country over to Egypt. And he's sold to be a slave. Wow. Can you even begin to imagine what that would have been like? In verse 36, it tells us that Joseph was sold to Potiphar. Now, I don't know if I've ever heard too much explanation ever about Potiphar. You need to understand something about Potiphar. This was not good news. Potiphar was the head henchman of the Pharaoh. He was captain of the guard, the Bible says. Potiphar was the man who handled all of the slaves. He had no compassion for any slave and for anything that was, that was going on. Uh, if you're a slave, the last person you wanted to work for was Potiphar. For Joseph, it could not have gotten any worse than going to Potiphar's house. And here, pampered Joseph, all of a sudden, taking out the garbage, scrubbing the, the trees, bowing and scraping, and being all alone in a foreign land. Here's the question I want you to answer today. If you were in Joseph's shoes, would you have been faithful to God? Or would you have been angry and God for letting this happen to you. How would you have reacted if that was you? Joseph, get this, Joseph, this 17 year old young man, stayed faithful to God. Not once, not even once, did this young man ever curse at God, complain, or was angry at God? Not even once are we told that. We may even think, well, that would have been natural. Oh, I think natural for some people. But it wasn't natural for Joseph. 
No, his natural reaction was to stay faithful and focused on God in his life. And that's exactly what he did. And matter of fact, in his house, it says that Potiphar noticed something different in Joseph's life. The reality is the world out there, if they don't even know you're a Christian, they're going to know something is different about you because of the way you live. He noticed something different about the way Joseph lived, different than all the other slaves. Maybe Joseph was positive. Maybe Joseph was helpful. Joseph wasn't complaining and angry and resentful. He just tried to live out his life every day before God. That's all he knew how to do. And that's what he did. To me, that's incredibly inspiring. And Joseph remained strong and faithful. And in chapter 39, it says that God prospered him. Why did he do that? Because Joseph honored God even in the hardest of circumstances. God saw his obedience. He saw his faithfulness. I want you to know God works in our lives in the same way. God will honor us when we honor him. And it says he found favor with his master. He saw the Lord in his life. J. Oswald son, son, uh, Sanders said, When you walk with God, there are marks that even the people of the world can see. Joseph was faithful. He was alone. I'm sure he was frightened at times. But he never wavered. And he held on to God. Before I finish, I want to share with you four quick lessons about adversity. I'm not going to do a lot of explaining about them, but they're very real and they're important to understand. Number one, prosperity is temporary. You be thankful what you have today. Do you know that? We all know that. What good things we have in life, they're all temporary. And so when God's blessing us and life is good and we're feeling, prosperity though is temporary. So let's just be thankful for what God has given. He honors that. Number two, adversity is inevitable, so you be prepared. It's going to happen. It already has in our past. It's going to happen in our future. Adversity is going to come, and some of it's going to be really tough. Right? Everybody else in this room can speak to that. You be prepared. How? Spiritually. You be prepared in your faith. It's strong. It can hold you up. When there's no hope, no matter what anyone else is saying, you can be strong in the middle of it because you're holding on to the one that never moved. That was God. He's still there. He knows he has not left you. That's exactly what Joseph did. Number three, effort is essential. You be diligent. You got to work at it. You got to keep going. You just got to keep going. And number four, God is faithful. So you trust him. No matter what. You trust God. Even when it seems like he is silent. Even when it seems like he is unfair. You may think you're getting the shaft, but God promises, right? Everything works together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In Isaiah 43, it says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. He doesn't say there will never be a flood. He says, only when it comes, you will not drown. The key is trust. We all know. That's not easy. But it is needed if we're going to make it by leaning on God. You see, without trust, you're trying to do stuff on your own. If you don't trust God, who are you trusting? Yourself? Doctors? 
Somebody else? Who are you trusting? If it's not God, where are you going? So we trust God. We pray to Him. We ask Him to be present and to help. Trust says, I can't make it on my own. I need you. You're the only one who can see me through all of this. You're the only one who can help. You're the only one who has the power of a miracle in your hand. And I will look to you, O God. Isn't it amazing how often God answers that prayer? He's already answered it in a lot of our lives. And when he does it, answer it exactly the way we had hoped. He still blesses. Maybe he took that person to heaven. Ah, that's where we're all going to go soon enough anyway. Maybe others came to know Christ because of what happened. Or maybe he just draws us to himself. He makes us think about who he is in our lives. And all of that, God will be honored as I completely and wholly, with my whole heart, trust him with my life. I love the song that we have chosen to sing of uh, the faithfulness of God. Great is thy faithfulness. It's on page 139 if you want to look over there. And it's a great, great old song. And the words are so encouraging. And I hope they will be to you this morning again. No matter what you have faced, no matter what you are facing, no matter what we might face, God will be faithful. Stand with me. Let's see. <clears throat> Father, we know tough things are being handled even on this day. And who knows what life will bring this week. But Lord, you'll be there. And Lord, in that moment, help us just to turn to you first and foremost. And Lord, we know you will be there for us no matter what. You always have been faithful. You always will be faithful. And we have come to worship you on this day. Because of that and so much more, we pray this and are thankful in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.